come here this morning to gather in his presence to be able to hear the king speak to us. Is that your desire this morning? You want to hear from him? Amen. I'm so thankful that even though he's a king, he's the king of kings, he looked beyond my faults. Amen. And he saw my needs. Amen. And you might have needs here this morning. Amen. You can leave here with all those needs met. Amen. All you have to do is have faith in God. And he is here this morning to meet your needs. Amen. Do you believe that? Let's stand and sing this morning, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace shall always be my song of
Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless your name this morning, Lord. Lord, you're worthy of all our praise and all glory and all honor, Lord. It goes to you, Lord. It belongs to you, Father. 
bless your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Glory to your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask our brother Chris Peterson. Brother Chris, you would come and open the service in a word of prayer. If you've got a need this morning, you want taken before the Lord, you just lift it to him as we go to prayer. If you're listening in on the internet, listening in on the phone hookup, you just take your need and hold it before the Lord and we, we will agree with you this morning. Amen. And where two or three are gathered together, he's here in our midst. Amen. Brother Chris. Let's bow our hands, please. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful, Lord, for what you've done for us, Lord Jesus. And we, Lord, we know, Lord, that it was nothing that we have ever done, Lord. It was your choice from the beginning of the foundation of the world, Lord. We just ask, Lord, that you be with us today. Lord, this is why we're gathered together, Lord. It is for you, Lord Jesus, to reveal your word to us, Lord. Just line upon line and precept upon precept. And we just ask that you anoint the minister, Brother Ed, Lord, and strengthen him, Lord. And we all are getting older, Lord. We all know, Lord, that we need, yeah, we need your help, Lord. We just need your strengthening, Lord. So we just ask you to come down and be with us this morning, Lord. We just give you so much thank. We give you all the praise, Lord, for all that you've done for us, Lord Jesus. We just ask that you be with us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, Lord. Bless you all. You may have your seats. Amen. We want to bless his name. We want to give him glory. This is an announcement for the events that will be coming up for the summer, in particular the camp announcement for August the 6th to the 12th that um, we'll find after the convention it will be sneaking up on us very quickly. So Brother Biscoll has asked that we be in prayer now all over this season for the convention, that God will minister and speak to lives and through the various ministry that will, God will use. But we want to just add a little thing there, pray also now for the, for the family camp. That's coming up. Um, I'd like to announce uh, who will be speaking. It'll be Brother Aaron McGeary. He'll be taking the uh, camp for us. He's uh, graciously accepted our invitation, and we're looking to having a wonderful time. He's been a, a great blessing to the assembly and to our young people over the years, and uh, we're looking for a very, very special time. Uh, junior camp will be from August the 6th, 7th and 8th. Senior camp will be 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. And as always, and it's, I'm thankful for it, there's more for us than there is against us. And I mean that by there's more counselors for us than there is against us. And we have too many, and that's a good problem. And I, I want to thank those that, uh, that have uh, submitted their names and have agreed to be our counselors this year. And if we haven't used you, uh, Lord willing, if God should give us another year, we will use you in some way or in some capacity. Um, our numbers, as you see, the church is growing, and um, we're having families, and, and as they grow older, there's less beds. And our, our senior uh, campers, which are the 21-22 age group, they're actually going to be junior counselors or assistant counselors because we need their beds for the growing crop that's coming up from underneath them. So you can see our dilemma. At first, Brother Jess didn't think that we would have enough room even at this camp, and we were contemplating bringing in trailers or tents or doing something drastic. But as it is with shifting that older uh, cabin, bringing him in as counselors and dropping off actually the number of senior uh, counselors, we've got enough room this year. So uh, we're thankful to the Lord for that. So be in prayer for, for the camp. Be in prayer for Brother Aaron McGarry. When I was talking to him, he's excited. And, uh, you know, Brother Aaron, he's, he's revved up. Uh, 7,000 revs already and ready to go, so we just want to pop the clutch and let the Holy Spirit come and minister to our children. God bless you. Thanks, Brother Tom. And we also have uh, a couple of announcements to make. Um, there is a choir practice this uh, for the junior choir this afternoon at 3 o'clock here at the church. Um, also, uh, for the family and friends of the 2007 graduating class, this is people who are graduating from grade 12. 
Uh, this is a reminder that grad is this Tuesday, June the 12th at Newlands Golf and Country Club. Grads and family come at 5.30 and guests please come at 6 p.m. Uh, the choir has a song for us this morning, Senior Choir, I believe, and if they could come and gather at this time. We also want to welcome those who are visiting with us and a special uh, welcome to uh, uh, Sister uh, Stephanie Coyne from Toronto and Sister Yolindi Digavea from Maine. Uh, not strangers here, we're really happy to have you here. And any others who are visiting with us, we want to uh, extend a real welcome. Let's uh, sing as the choir is coming. I will praise him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. I will. tried so hard to hide though I laughed and said my life is fine without you I was covering up the secret tears I cried then one day some sin's power and set my spirit free. I'm amazed that you love me. I'm amazed how you came through your precious blood. never be as close to me. I'm not afraid to face the problems of tomorrow. Knowing you are everything I'll ever need. Yes, I
Praise God. Some of you are glad. Amen. Amen. They're gone. The sea of God's forgetfulness. We're going to be turning to the word now as uh, our pastor comes. Let's sing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. This is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
psalmist David that said, I will say to my soul, praise ye the Lord. Sometimes we have to tell our soul, you're going to praise God. You didn't come here just to warm a seat. You came here to be a participant. You came here while you've got breath in your lungs and in your body and life to say something of, of the grace of God. And that's the best way I know to do it. I'll praise him. I'll give him glory. And the, the last verse of that chorus, the verse of the song we just sang, perfect submission, all is at rest, is so much in keeping with the service this morning that I feel in my heart to speak. I'd like to sing that verse again. And just before we, just before we do, I would like to just make these comments. Uh, we're very much in preparation for the convention which is taking place. I want to uh, show my appreciation for all of those that are uh, putting such an effort out, and there's a lot of effort out for those of you that have opened your homes. Uh, I see for myself there are two real thrusts that I feel in my spirit uh, that I would like to see happen. And one is I'd like that the congregation here would be an example message church. And I believe that you are. I just want that to be expressed in a very wonderful way to all the people that will be coming in our conduct, in our hospitality, in our zeal, and in our, our Holy Ghost filled life. I believe that we can be that and express that and be an encouragement to others so that they can visit here and say we had a glorious time, we heard a rich word, we met wonderful people, and we go home with uh, an, an uh, uh, edified that we want to continue with this kind of atmosphere. You believe that's possible? What, we have a message, why, why can't we have a model message church? You believe it? I don't want to feel like I'm pulling a sled over dry ground now. Do you believe it? All right, then let's, let's just say, well, we will do that. By God's grace, we'll do that. And the second thrust is that we, it has just been my own personal uh, insatiable desire, which I never, never can get away from, neither do I want to get away from it, and that is to provide the message to the peoples of the world in the language they can understand something that you and I so enjoy and we just become enraptured with the words that God sent to us through his prophet messenger that we can dedicate ourselves and say we will do all that we can to see that this reaches as far as possible uh, to as many people as possible to whatever doors that God opens to us so we want to be remembering also especially brother Tony is uh, still in uh, uh, Brazil and uh, attending to some things. He's got some real burdens down there. And so I also want to say you've been praying that the different pastors will be able to get visas to come. Uh, Brother Vernon from the Philippines got his visa this last week. We're very happy over that. Brother Cesar and his wife got their visas from Brazil. And uh, so there's over 70 pastors from probably somewhere between 15 and 20 countries that have now confirmed are able to be here so we're really thankful about that and for those of you that are streaming on the internet uh, we we want you to know that we certainly appreciate your prayers and your comments and there are many uh, last last Sunday there was uh, somewhere around 170 some locations that were live streaming during the service while you're here worshiping. And, uh, and from that day to this, from Sunday to Sunday, there was about another 300 and some that had connected through the archiving because their timing is not right, China and some of these countries. And from over 33, or not over, but 33 nations with 304, I believe it was. I very rarely look, but I just wanted to let you know that this is a real live audience, and we are participating with them, and they are participating with us, and we just want to say God's blessings upon them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Remember also beginning next Sunday. Next Sunday will just be one one Sunday service. It'll be we're going to go one Sunday service now for the summer during the congestion on the on the border. I know sometimes it's not congested, other times it's terribly congested, but we're going to have a we'll we, we'll just count on having a camp meeting every Sunday morning. And how long it goes, we don't know. We're not going to drag it out on purpose, but we're going to be here with no time restraints. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I believe I got enough support for that to do it. Amen. Have you been praying for this service? Did you put your order in for this service? Amen. There's a baptismal tonight. Uh, at least two are being baptized. It's wonderful what God is doing, friends. One of the young men that's going to be baptized tonight is a real blessing. Uh, this, this is the time God moved on him last Sunday. And I understand, I can't say his testimony, but I understand. I haven't talked with him directly. But I understand he's never been at the front never been baptized from one of our good believing families but he's going to be baptized tonight and as soon as he had that experience last Sunday morning he's told our brother Tom I just can't get enough of the Word of God I have an insatiable thirst for the Word of God I can't pass a message book without picking it up and reading it and devouring it that's a good sign it's a good sign Hallelujah. Get hungry right away. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? There's a man here in the congregation, and he won't mind me saying this, I'm sure. But I just shook hands with him last Sunday morning coming into the service. And Brother Mike Cozzolano said, I'd like to have a little prayer cloth. Do you have a prayer cloth? I said, yes. I'd like a prayer cloth for my friend, so I shook hands with him. Brother Mike Cosolino said, this man knew Brother Tom Ray before he was married. Oh, I was shaking hands with him. So I said, so you knew Brother Tom Ray? He said, so I said, Safeway. He said, yes, Safeway. We work together at Safeway says it and then he got converted and I thought this is he may not realize this but I was I was just stunned that over 30 years probably 33 years and I'm standing here in front of our church doors with a man that's seated here now and he remembers of one of the associate ministers here and the first thing he remembers is before he was married. And the second thing he remembers, then he got converted. The testimony, friends. You might think it's forgotten. It's not forgotten. God knows exactly the moment and letting that light shine. Amen. Blessed assurance. Perfect submission. Hallelujah. Can you sing it with me now?
Heavenly Father, we are so privileged and so thankful that we can address you and approach you and call you our Father, that we have come from your loins, we've come from the Father's genes, and where we have come from is where we will go back to. We thank you for eternal life through Jesus Christ, God's Lamb, the sacrificed Lamb. Oh, thank you for the blood that was shed. The price was paid. And the words of our Lord Jesus could say and did say, it is finished. Today, Lord, we rest in that finished work. Today, we rejoice in that finished work and that you have sent the Holy Spirit down within these human vessels, giving witness and testimony that the work is a finished work. Bless this congregation the visible congregation, the internet congregation, and all who may ever participate in this service. May the whole same Holy Spirit present here now be present everywhere, Lord. Pray you'll bless us now with a spirit of revelation as we read your scripture. For you are the author, and we're trusting you as the author. Make known this message to us, O God. Give understanding, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, if you would, the third chapter. Beginning to read at the seventh verse. And then we're going to continue in the fourth chapter for six verses. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation in the day of the temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, <clears throat> They do all we err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I want to just stop there to say unbelief. Unbelief has a hardening effect. Through the hardened, through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is also deceitful. And it is hardening of, of, of our spirit. For we are made, verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. <clears throat> While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. <clears throat> but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place, of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. It remaineth that some must enter therein. God bless you as you have your seat. Amen. 
some must enter in. It remaineth that some must enter in. I'm glad that is in there. I identify with that. I'm, I'm some of that must. I'm one of those. You're one of those? That's got to be a personal witness within your own soul. There are some that must enter in, and I'm part of that group. Amen. And to enter in, and uh, the word that Paul has used here is not just to enter as we may think of entering into a place such as this, but the, an entrance into any condition, an entrance into any condition or to, and the word also implies to arise and come into existence. In other words, prior to this entering in, we may be the person that we are, but we, don't, we haven't really come into our existence. We haven't come into what we are to be or what is intended for us to be. And so Paul is saying here and using this word throughout these two chapters, and if you'll notice, please, that the Bible is calling it, God is calling it my rest. Not your rest, but it's my rest. God's rest. We're entering into His rest. That's what the Scripture is speaking about. And only by coming into His rest can we really be in the right place. Only coming into His rest can we be, can we come into what I would say true existence. Outside of that, we're not having a true existence. We come to life and to come to come into real true existence or our real true e condition. R right at this time of the year, we've, in this part of the world, at least in North America, United States, Canada, our students are <coughs> completing school, many of them, completing their 12th grade of education, looking forward perhaps to further education and uh, we will have uh, grad ceremonies, many of you, in the next couple of weeks. So you'll be completing and concluding that part of your life, your education, and looking forward to whatever else you might be doing. A lot of decisions, decisions will be made at a different level now when the young people come to that uh, time. And you'll be facing challenges, uh, uncharted waters that you've never traversed, new pathways, and we can say decisions, decisions, plenty of them. You want to have the Holy Spirit guiding you in this part of your life. And for those that are looking towards a further education, some field of education, uh, I understand that many colleges, uh, universities, they require an entrance exam. And there is an entrance procedure. There, they may require, and I, I looked into it because that's what I'm speaking of, entering in to this rest, entering into this condition, entering into your true existence. And now some of you that have finished this phase of your education, you want to enter into what I really want to be what I expect to be, what my true existence will be in life. I'm going to be this or I'm going to be something else and I want to prepare myself and so now I need further education to, to uh, get the kind of uh, skills that I will require for the rest of my life and even to enter into what your true existence will be, you've got to have a, uh, you've got to go through some procedures for your entrance exams. And it said, uh, uh, you must try your best to perform well on these exams. And I can say that is true also in the spiritual sense. Your performance on the required entrance exam is only one part of the admission criteria. Other criteria include your grade point average uh, or your marks, your scores, uh, letters of recommendations, perhaps essays, etc. This is just for natural education. You are 
well advised to take these exams seriously. And if that applies there, how much more so now? A sound preparation can enhance your performance significantly. Help is abundantly available, and I can say that is certainly the case here. Help is abundantly available in the form of information on the web and books and coaching and classes. Research what is, be research what is best for you and what you can afford. Well, let me say to you, you can afford this. And we're having not merely a convention. We're not having a convention to have a convention. We haven't had it for 10 years. And as soon as we announced we would have that, you know, then Brother Tom, some of the brothers here asked, well, will we have family camp? I said, I believe that we need to have family camp. I don't think that our, our people will forgive us if we don't have a family camp because it's a great time when it's, it's not a convention atmosphere. It's a family camp atmosphere where parents are mingling with their children and, and our vision and desire, I think this is 21 years. Every year we've had family camp and have gone from probably 60 young people to almost 400 young people and uh, from maybe two, 300 on the camp or maybe even less than 200 to last year, I think they filled 1,000 seats. We had rented, had 1,000 seats under the tent and this is not just a, you know, this is not a, a time of frivolity and just and so on, but it's a time when family relationships are forged together, when mothers and fathers are able to be with their young people and the desire because out, out in the world, the spirit of the world is so uh, in intent on destroying the family, uh, the family ties. And that's the first thing that Satan did in, the, in Eden was dismember the family. And we are opposed to that. We are absolutely directly opposed to it. We believe in the family. We believe that God has ordained that we shall have family. And I believe as father, as a father myself, you can't take my place, I can't take yours. But as a father, I've claimed my family for God. Amen. Hallelujah. My children and my children's children. And I say the devil's a liar. Amen. Hallelujah. And whatever he may attempt to do and whatever he succeeds in doing, I don't call it an ultimate success. I call him an ultimate failure. And the, and the promise of God is yea and amen. amen. Hallelujah. And I won't let anyone take that away from me and don't let anyone take that away from you. If you want to follow in the footsteps of your pastor, you can follow in those footsteps. God's word is true. Amen. Hallelujah. And we believe the, the circle shall not be broken on the other side. Hallelujah. Say, well, what if it looks impossible? God is a God of the impossible. Hallelujah. Today, in this time, many of you that will are graduating, and I don't want to spend much time on this because I want to get to the scripture, but this is certainly a good foundation for it you will be making more decisions. I went and heard a woman a few years ago speak to a graduating class when some of our young people were graduating out of the 12th grade. And she said at that time, she said, some years ago, you would only uh, prepare for one, one profession and you would expect to stay in that profession for the rest of your days. But she said, most of you will have as many as five jobs. You'll train for five different jobs. And today there are many more decisions than just making a decision for one. People used to work for one or two lawyers in a lifetime, but the U.S. Department of Labor stats show that today both men and women between the ages of 18 to 40 will have over 10 jobs in their lifetime over 10 different jobs. So it's doubled even since I sat in that graduating class a few years ago. So there's a lot of decisions that are being made. Instead of a young person saying, I'm gonna be a doctor, I'm gonna be this, they might be that for the rest of their life. But the average American has 10 jobs that between 18 and, and 40 year old Americans. And that is what uh, we have garnered from their website. They say that also that the average family moves 12 times. The average 
American family moves on 12 times in their lifetime. And so the families today are much more transient, much more moving. And moving is a big decision. Moving is a costly decision. And I have said to so many here that have moved and have come here, you can pull up your roots in five minutes, but you can't put them down in five. And it's putting them down that, that really takes some time and some patience, and there's hardship and work and labor and putting your roots down. You can put them up in just a few moments, say, let's go, pack up. We're out of here. We're history. But to then to change uh, your place of dwelling, change the whole atmosphere, the whole environment, your conditions, your culture, your job, your position, and some of those which you, it, it's, a, it's a tearing experience. And so uh, I'm just saying that by way of, of, of a foundation for the, for the service this morning. I'm not speaking about that, but I do believe that uh, we must be prepared. The songwriter said, I've been traveling for Jesus so much of my life. Been traveling or land or, or on sea. And I said, well, amen to that. But I'm planning on taking a trip to the sky. And that will be the last move for me. He went on to say, here I'm bothered with packing each time that I move and carry a load in each hand. But I'll not need one thing that I've used in this world when I move to that heavenly land when I make my last move. Hallelujah. We all are faced with our own unique set of circumstances. We sit here today beside family, perhaps husband, wife, individual, our friends, our peers. And uh, I would say there isn't a person here but what we are facing some sort of a decision, as I spoke on decisions last Sunday, carrying on a wee bit. But I'm wanting to come now to where I really wanted to approach last Sunday service. Uh, we want to make a move in our spiritual life. We want to perhaps, and I may not be speaking to 100% of the congregation, but I think I'll be speaking to most everyone. We want to move from where we are spiritually to another dimension, to another level. And I'm sure we all hunger after that. And I'm going to take a message that the prophet of God left us and how he broke it down, and it is incredibly revealing and enlightening. And I feel that when I have covered what he has said, it will cover every single person in this building. Not, a, well, not one person will be left out. And so you can look for that part that refers to you. In the scripture which we read, <clears throat> Hebrews is written by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is writing to the Hebrews, and he has two main concerns because they are Jews, and he is a Jew. And he can understand what it is to, because they're, they're, they're leaving one element and moving to another, and that is the, they're, they're leaving essentially the law and all of, its, all of its regulations and all of its washings and all of these things. And Rabbi Richman has said, and also Gershon Solomon has said, and I've heard them both say it, that the law had 600, they have 613 laws in the Old Testament. And Jews keep those laws. The ultra-Orthodox Jews uh, attempt to keep those 613 laws laws which are left from the Old Testament. Paul knew something of the struggle of the Jews coming out of that, out of Judaism, and in, into followers of Christ, to become believers of Christ. And so the two themes that are in Hebrews, which will now apply to the scripture we read, he was wanting to prove to the Jewish Christians that Judaism, as they had known it, had come to an end through the fulfillment of the Scripture in Jesus Christ, that he was the fulfillment of the whole purpose of God 
in the law. And so that now, now it was to have faith in Christ. And, and it seems so simplistic. I'm sure it was difficult because they were, uh, they were uh, so trained from childhood, from birth. They had to do things. You have to do this. You have to do this washing. You have to do it a certain way. And all of these sacrifices a certain way in the way we eat and the way we dress and the way we do everything. And now Paul is trying to tell them that this has been completed in Christ. Christ is the fulfillment and the end of the law. And then secondly, that there was a danger, a very real danger with these new believers for we can identify with this. There was a danger that the Jewish believers would lapse back, would lapse back into Judaism or simply pause and not move forward in the message of the hour. And we certainly can identify with that. There's a danger. Many of us come from all kinds of denominations and churches and whatever more. And, and there's a danger within the message of lapsing back and, and, and hanging on to traits of the past and hanging on to forms of the past and things that have been dragged in from, uh, we'll say, Christianity, churchanity, uh, the religious world, dragging those things up, say, well, we need to continue with those. Or coming into the message and then, and then just becoming uh, stagnant, not moving forward, saying, well, well, you know, this is good enough. Yeah, okay, God sent a prophet, Malachi 4, uh, Luke 17, 30, fine, wonderful. And, you know, God had baptism, serpent seed, whatever more. And then we, we remain there and we don't move forward. That's what Paul was saying. And that is why he, he, he could say that because even him, himself, he made this testimony. He said, though I might have also confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he may trust in the flesh, I more. He's establishing himself as a Jew to the Philippians. He said, I'm circumcised, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrew, as concerning touching the law, a Pharisee, and concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. I, if anybody's a Jew, he says, I'm a Jew. I'm a circumcised the eighth day. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a zealous Jew. I'm, I, I've kept the law to perfection and all of those things. And so he was saying that, you know, I have a right. I know what it is that you're going through. And to you Hebrews, you must not pause. You must not lapse back. And you must not just stay where you are. There is a rest. There's another place. And we must enter into that rest. We must, in other words, inherit everything that God purchased for us. Why sit and be idle? Why sit and just lapse back? Why be satisfied with less than what God has provided for us? Hallelujah. So Paul could say, as he did in Hebrews 6, he said, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. You know, there are some even within the message say, well, I'm just staying with the ABCs. I'm just staying with the ABCs. Well, I can tell you, Apostle Paul would rebuke anybody saying that, saying it's much more than ABCs. Some people want to stay in their own comfort zone and just say, well, I just, you know, stay with the simple things. It's, it's uh, hey, whatever, whatever the prophet of God delivered, that's what he intends us to eat. God didn't send it to us to, you know, just to look at and put it and hang it on the wall and put the book in a, in, as, a, as a, a display in a cabinet or something. God intended the people to participate and take a hold of it and to have it lived out. There's a message for this hour. Amen. So leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. So Paul is saying, let us move on from that. Perfection, in this case, the first word that perfection means is a finisher. Paul was a finisher. 
Paul said in, in Acts, the 20th chapter, he said, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save, except he knew this, save that the Holy Spirit has witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. So I don't know what's going to befall me completely, but the Holy Spirit has also witnessed that in every city, bonds and afflictions uh, abide me. Those things will be with me. But he says, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Not that I be dragged out in the end and get through by the skin of my teeth. But he says, none of these things. And listen, friends, we don't want to take this as a sermon this morning. You've got to apply it to your own self. The Holy Spirit witnesses to me that I'm not in a Sunday school picnic. The Holy Spirit witnesses to me that this way won't be an easy way. Whatever my future is, the Holy Spirit witnesses to me this will be a battle. And the prophet says, I'll fight for every inch. And you've got to be resolved in your heart. I'm prepared to fight for every inch. Nothing shall move me. None of these things move me. Can this congregation say amen? amen? Down in your soul, can that resound an amen? Nothing shall move me. Don't be caught in my inspiration. Be caught in your own inspiration. Don't be caught in my witness. Be caught in your own witness. None of these things shall move me. Nothing that Satan can throw in my way. No enchantment. No enticement. Hallelujah. Nothing of these things shall move me. I know that there's afflictions that abide me. The Holy Spirit witnesses this won't be an easy way, but I'm going to finish my course with joy. That is perfection. I'm going to, I'm going to be mature enough that I can make that kind of, of a decision. And that is why Apostle Paul could also say, he could say that I have, I have finished my course. He said to Timothy, I have finished my course. Here he was saying that I may finish my course. But then he was able to write that old apostle to Timothy. He said, I have finished my course. Glory to God. Therefore, there's a crown laid up for me. We, every person here wants to be able to make that testimony. To complete, let us go on to perfection. Let's complete the journey. To accomplish what we've been called to accomplish. And Paul is saying, let us go on to full age. Don't let us remain as children. Oh, they didn't shake my hand. They didn't look at me just right. Or, or this thing, I had a bad day. What's that got to do with it? That's got nothing to do with it. I'm going through a tough time. You're supposed to expect that. Hallelujah, you're to expect that. We haven't been called to an easy way. It also says in, in Hebrews, Paul telling the Hebrews, for when the time that ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principle. Now he's talking to the Jewish believers. He's talking to people that came into the message. That's who he's talking to. He's not talking to a bunch of unbelievers. He's talking to people who came into the message. He said, by the time when you should be teachers, so then you have need to be taught again of the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. That he's talking about. Coming to perfection. Let's move to perfection. And it belongs to them of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and and evil. Therefore, it remaineth that some must enter into my rest. Brother Branham takes the tabernacle of the wilderness. I was going to put it on the screen, but I'm not going to distract you with it now. The tabernacle in the wilderness was built in uh, three parts, as is it has direct reference, and this is fundamental to a lot of you, but many and some of our young people coming up. It has direct reference to your physical body, your physical being. You are body, you are spirit, and you are soul. Your body has a five channels. Your spirit has five channels. And a lot of people can't remember those five channels. I don't have the best memory in the world. 
But I, I use a, my own little code, and I use it in my car for the, for the five channels to the, to the spirit. My car, M, for your memory. I, for your imagination. C, for your conscience. A, for your affection. And R, for reasoning. And four of those five are in the mind. And it involves your affection, your memory, what you think, your imagination, what you can be. All of these things, and they are so close. Now, the, the scripture which the prophet used all the time throughout his entire ministry is this one. For the word of God is quick and powerful. Now, here's where Pentecost and so many religions and so many theologians and men of great learning, they missed it completely because when the prophet of God was standing there discerning the secrets of the people's hearts, they thought, what a marvelous gift. Oh, God has given a gift of discernment. It was no gift of discernment. And he kept using the scripture. And they should have caught it. They should have caught it. He said it over and over hundreds and hundreds of times. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Not the gift of God, the Word of God. The Word of God, God's breath. God's own breath. God's Word. Not a man's Word. Not William Branham's Word or Ed Biscoe's Word or anybody else's Word. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, not body and spirit. It doesn't take the word to divide between this flesh and my spirit, but between the spirit and the soul because they are so closely merged together. They're not one, but they're so closely merged together. That's why when a lot of young people are coming to uh, the state of the emotion that's involved with courtship and, and who I'll marry and, and marriage and so on, it is so close, that emotional, that highly concentrated emotional area. And, 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 and I say, you know, well, are you really certain? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely certain because, you know, because of this and I've seen that sign and et cetera, et cetera. And only the word can actually divide between what is spirit and what is soul. Only the, only the message of the hour, only. Theology can't do it. Catechism can't do it. Sunday schools can't do it. Uh, even preachers can't do it. But the word that comes sent from God out of the messenger's mouth can divide it has, a, it has a surgical accuracy to divide between the spirit and the soul. And the word can divide between the spirit and the soul. And so we have now the outer court, which is the, your body. We have the inner court. It's called also the holy place, which is your spirit realm. And then, and then there is the holy of holies. And there was a curtain between the holy place and the holy of holies. And in the outer court, the people, congregation, could come. And the inner court was where the priests came to minister. And in the holy of holies, only the high priest, once a year, not without blood, could enter into the holy of holies. And in each of these places, they had their various instruments and the various vessels. And they had a certain kind of an altar. And then you go into the holy place, they had the altar of showbread, the table of showbread, and the candlestick in the holy place. But in the holy of holies was only the ark of the covenant with the cherubim standing over it with their wings touching. And that was, and the word of God laying in the ark of the covenant. And you are body, spirit, and soul. And in the outer court, we have certain needs, certain requirements, and God has provided for that. And in the inner court, where the priests could go, they, they, there are different kind of implements and, and altars and so on and different kind of light there. And in the holy of holies was different. And God said to Moses, you will make a tabernacle this is how you'll make it 
and he's made these words so that I may dwell there. Amen. And the word that God has sent has been designed specifically for your soul. Now, there are benefits which flow to your emotional realm. There's benefits which flow to all the other realm. There's benefits which flow to you physically. But now how the prophet's message and how the prophet's ministry came out and first started to touch the body, take people by the hand. And the, and the religious world, for the most part, became consumed with that. Oh, I just need healing. Oh, if you'll just tell me my sickness. They're missing it. This was the vessel that would send the word and heal the soul. It's our souls that needed healing. The altar needed to be rebuilt. Can you say amen? It's your soul, friend. And then when the word reaches the soul, see, Satan has reversed this thing. But when the word of God, the revelation of the word, reaches your soul and takes control, and you're born again, born of the spirit and the word, then that new birth begins to emanate and rise up and takes charge and control of the spirit realm. Th then that word takes control of your imagination. That word takes control of your memory because there's some things in your memory you should remember and there's some things in your memory you must forget. And only the word can decipher what should be forgotten and what should be remembered. It's got to come from the soul. Come up and take and clear out that memory channel. Some of you people here today got memories you need to forget. It's been plaguing your mind and you need to forget it. You need to put it on God's altar and let the holy fire of God consume it and end it all. And I say you need to move. You need to move today. You need to make the decision, I'm moving. I'm packing up. I'm leaving that behind. I'm letting the word minister. I'm going to let the word decide what I remember and what I forget. And then into the imagination. People imagine all kinds of things. People even have an imaginary, oh my, this is another whole message. Help me now. They have an, Im an imaginary uh, they have an imaginary Jesus. The world has an imaginary Jesus. And they're not in love with the Jesus of the Bible. They're in love with the Jesus of their imagination. And there's a danger right within the message. Well, what did Jesus say to the Pharisees and the people of his day? Oh, people who are dressed right. You couldn't lay a finger on their lives. If they were believers of today, you couldn't even put a finger on their lives. They were so precise and so perfect. Jesus said, your fathers, your fathers, you garnish the tombs. You spend your time making the tombs of the prophets. Go there with all the righteous feeling and everything and all the outward appearance, garnishing and giving honor to the prophets that had died Jesus said, you hypocrites, your fathers killed them and put them in there. But you see, those men, if you told them and said, you hate the prophets, said, what are you saying? That's a blasphemy to us. We don't hate the prophets. We love the prophets. Jesus said, your fathers killed the prophets. But what they did, they had garnished. They had, they had, um, um, they, they had uh, honored the position of the prophets, and they had built uh, an imaginary image of what the prophets were. And they were in love with that image, not the prophet themselves. And a lot of people today say, oh, Brother Branham, and they get Brother Branham into a place, and uh, into an exalted place, and a position, and something. God exalted him. God put him in the place that he had, but they get him in some kind of a place. And if they had lived maybe back there with him and just seen him as a human man and making the mistakes that he made or living the life that he lived, you might not have been impressed with it. But what, so you say, well, today, what are people impressed with? You're impressed with what your imagination has constructed. That's what you're impressed with. If you lived right then when Jesus lived and you saw his frailty, and he did things that you might understand. People picked up stones to stone him, and, and he ran and dispensed. And you might say, what's he doing? You know, I believe he's a God in the flesh. What's God in the flesh running from? 
And you might not be impressed with that. And a lot of other things which he did. He was weary and maybe sat, just healed somebody lame and oh, he then lay over here and with a headache. Tempted in all points. As every man. Tempted in all points. Is that what the scripture says? But the image that people have constructed is a Christ that never was tempted, never had any difficulty, never was anything. That's you're in love with your image. You're in love not with the real person. You're in love with what you've constructed him to be. I hadn't planned on getting into that. But that's why you need. You need the word. You need the word to come in and separate in the imagination and in your conscience how many people are condemned that are real born again believers you're condemned and, 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 and hang on guilt hangs on to you you can't seem to shake free of it that condemnation has no right your conscience has no right to cloud your life with condemnation for the word of God has said, here it comes, quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. For there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. So the question now is, am I in Christ Jesus? And if you can say, yay, amen, I am in Christ Jesus, then there is now therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. So your memory, Satan tries to poke something in your memory channel and say, oh, look at this back there, and try to bring condemnation on you. And you say, well, now I'll just let the word come up into that memory channel and clear that one out. Hallelujah, for there's now therefore no condemnation. I don't care what kind of a failure it has been. I don't care what, what has happened in the past. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed that perfectly. And if he hasn't, then he failed. He died in vain at Calvary. So people want to think of the power of Calvary, but somehow they want to give uh, consideration to Satan to have control of our lives. He hasn't got any control of our lives. And the prophet of God has said that when a sin is confessed, it drops into the bleach of the blood of Jesus Christ and it breaks up. That bleach actually breaks up. It literally breaks up. Is this what he said? Is this what he said? It breaks up the very elements of the, of the, of the ink. And you've heard me say it. And he says even the ink becomes bleach. It is so purging and so purifying and so powerful your sin is no match for the blood of Jesus Christ <laughs> hallelujah so it remaineth that some must enter in I'm preaching this this morning because there may be some here that have to move from the outer court and so now we have these three courts I'm going to move along qu quickly I'm going to just give the Brother Branham's description of the outer court. He said, many Christians in my life, he's seen many Christians in his life to be up and down. Seems to have such a deep desire. Daily they search and hunt and seek for God and never come to any settlement of any kind to where they could ever be settled or anchored in Christ. This is, I'm describing the outer court. I've inserted this scripture. Jesus spoke of the sower and the seed. And he spoke of the one group and he says, and they have no root in themselves. And so they endure, but for a short time and afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth, for the world's, for the word's sake, because of the word, soon as persecution arise or affliction, because of the word's sake, immediately they are offended. That is why I spoke of decisions. We need, and especially those that have given themselves to this message, we need to have a resolve because a resolve also is a part of faith, a resolve. And, and speak the words of Apostle Paul. Say them to yourself today. None of these things 
shall move me. I know that there's bonds. I know that there's afflictions. There can be all kinds of trouble, whatever it might be, but none of these things shall move me. And if you say, well, I've been up and down, I've been in and out, I've been unstable, I've been so that I have no, I need an anchor, then I'm telling you what to do today. If I was sitting across the desk from you, if you were in my office or where I was in your home, you say, Brother Ed, what shall I do? I'll tell you what to do. Pack up and get ready to move. Where are you going to move? Well, I would pack up and say, I'm not stopping in this outer court anymore. I'm not dwelling here anymore. I'm not having my ups and downs anymore. I'm not going to be moved by these distresses anymore. I'm moving out of here. Hallelujah. Pick up your bags if you have any and move on, uh, on to the holy place and right on into the holy of holies. He speaks about these people. He said the one intellectually, intellectually is hungry. He's feasting on God, but his feast doesn't hold out. You might be here, and no doubt some are. Intellectually, he's hungering for God and feasting on God, but his feast doesn't hold out. That's what you'll find is the theme throughout this. He went on to say, many people go to the service, such as we have this morning. They rejoice. They shout. We're talking about the outer court now. Shouting's fine in the outer court. Hey, in the outer court, you say, well, oh my, I just feel it. That's fine. Shout. <laughs> Make sure that when the feeling's gone, something's still anchored there. <laughs> and if you find, well, you know what? I shouted, I had such a wonderful time. Oh, I had such a marvelous feeling. Phew, I don't even know where it went. Say, so what should I do, Brother Ed? Pack up. Get ready to move. Make a decision. Don't be in love with your old self. Say, I don't like my old self. I'm moving to another place. says they have, they shout and they praise the Lord. And while the Spirit of God is falling, all condemnation left their hearts. And a day or two after the revival, they find themselves back in the old grind again. They're eating manna. He said the justified man out here, out in the outer court, the man is justified. He walks by daylight. I touched on this last Sunday, but now I want to enlarge on it. He walks by daylight. I have to make a confession. I actually have, I've wondered, you know, if the Lord is, I don't want to grieve the Lord. I don't want to displease the Lord. But I have complained more this winter than I have at any time of 37 years of living here in this area. Not again. I don't have to live in this pea soup again. I can't even see the hills. I can't even see across the valley. I just, this dismal drizzle. Why doesn't it go back where it came from? And I know that there's a sun up there, and I just so want to see it. Do I have any friends? And when the sun is out, I don't care, you know, maybe it doesn't affect you. But when the sun is out and I see the early in the morning, the sun hitting the trees, I feel better already. <laughs> but should I feel more spiritual? No, I shouldn't. But somehow it affects me. And so I, I realize right away, I better pass through this outer court real quick. I better not stay here because this is going to really bother me. I think all of you folks are human enough to say, I, I've been there. Yeah, I've been there. But you know, and that's exactly, I feel so sorry for people from Arizona and people that have come from Florida and people that have come from South Africa 
where the first time I ever really heard about South Africa, I was on my way there, and I stepped into a travel agency in, in Switzerland to catch a, buy a ticket for South Africa. And my wife, my family there, and I step in, here's a little calendar, just a little wee calendar. And I looked at that calendar, and on the bottom it was printed there, so it could never change. It's sunny today in South Africa. <laughs> I never forgot that. It's as, real as, it's as real as I'm looking at it right now. And I said within myself, well, that's a bold statement. They're very certain of their weather. It's sunny today in South Africa. And uh, I can say I have found it cloudy and cold too, but nevertheless. And I say to myself, is it all right? We're just a family here this morning. I say, why do people move here? Why do you come here? Why, why do you stay where it's sunny? But you know what? I'm not God. I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet. But when I see, you know, God put something in somebody's heart, I don't know what, why he's moving them and shifting them around. I don't know. I just leave that up to him. But I know one thing. The outer court, and whether the sun is shining and the prophet's saying, we're, we're, you know, out there, if the sun was shining, you're feeling good. And if it's not shining, you're not feeling good. But that, that isn't where we dwell. That's not where we live. And that's not the, the message came to provide us. He didn't come to provide us with an environment that's dictated to by, you know, our exterior environment. You folks might as well say amen. amen. This is absolutely the message. And I'm not talking just about the weather. I'm talking about our, our circumstances and the environment around us. We have to know, he said, he walks by daylight. Some day has gloomy days. Some days you do not know whether it's really worthwhile to serve God or not. You're walking in the outer court. So you're eating manna? Sure. You're a believer? Sure. You have eternal life? Sure. And if you die, you go to heaven? But what kind of life are you living? Every day you get out there, oh, I got my dandruff up today. Maybe you don't know that terminology, but that was being, you know, got really, you know, upset. I told them about it. I cussed them out. I couldn't help it. God forgive me. Sure he will. Certainly he will. You're his child. But what kind of life you're living? Comes to it the second time. He says, my don't you hate to live that kind of life? <laughs> I'm talking to somebody here. That says, I hate the kind of life. I'm up, I'm down. I, uh, you know, the flesh gets the best of me. He says, and he says, in the trouble, and that you pull day and night, backslidden back to church, backslidden back to church, this, that, apologizing to this over here, this fellow's just blooming all right along. You see, saying, I'm in and I'm out. When he just says, I'm up and down, I, I'm backslidden, no, I'm in victory, I'm backslidden, no, I'm in victory. I, I, I see people like that. I'm here to tell you today, I'm your friend. I'm here to tell you today, you don't have to have that. Amen. I'm here to tell you today, isn't that good news? Amen. Isn't that good news for somebody here? You don't have to be on the bottom. You can feel on the bottom, but you don't have to be there. You're not ordained to live there. Amen. Out of fellowship, into fellowship. You're not ordained for that. You're not made for that. Hallelujah. You're not made for the defeat. Some say, I've heard the odd criticism against our ministry here. They say it's too positive. Let me just tell you, plus all the critics that might say that, we're not nearly as positive as the prophet said we should be. Because I have all kinds of negative things come by my way, and I spend too much time on it. Because, you know, it bothers you, and it troubles you, and so on, and you get burdened, and you've got to stop it when it's just a burden on your heart and don't let it uh, occupy your mind and start affecting your life because I don't like that kind of life. 
Then he says, what kind of life are you living? I want to live when he talks about just steady all the time, blooming all the time, victory all the time, love all the time. That's what he said. And that's what I say is a positive message. I'm going to make that confession. You need to make that confession. That life is my life. That's what God purposed for me. All right? That's the outer court. And that's the, if the description fits, you should make a clear-cut decision to move. I don't care whether you move here or where you move physically, that's irrelevant. Now I just want to go for a short moment to the, to the, next, to the next place, and that is probably should have spent a little more time on it, but the, that spirit realm or in the tabernacle was the holy place. And then Brother Branham says, well, he comes into the court now. What's in there? There's seven golden candlesticks, and by, by that holy place, and it's giving light. So now he's, he said it's a better light. The candlesticks are giving light, and that's to the man. He quits his drinking, quits his smoking, quits lying, quits stealing, treats his neighbor right, good to his wife or her, good to her husband, in the same way, a man or a woman, the believer, he comes into a place where he's quit all his meanness, which is through the blood of sanctification. He's called to a new life, and he walks in there. See, he's moved. He's walked in there. He doesn't have to walk by the light out there. Whether the sun is shining, whether it's gloomy, whether, whether, whether he just lost his job or got fired or all the environment or whatever's happening in school, whether you passed with A's or you barely got through by the skin of your teeth or whatever happened out there, that's irrelevant to this man because he's, he's, he's got another light. He doesn't have to walk by the light out there. He's got a better light. He's walking by the light of the seven golden candlesticks, which is burning Olive oil, and the olive oil was representing the Holy Spirit. The fire was the baptism which brought baptizing. So now this man has moved. And you know, a lot of people in the message just want to stay there. That's all they want to stay. Are you baptized with the Holy Ghost? Are you baptized with the Holy Ghost? Let me tell you something. You're not into the, you're not into the next department yet. You're not into the Holy of Holies yet. You can have the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but remember, still it's just a gift. And Brother Bram said to me, he says this, took a pen out of his pocket. He said, this is a gift of the Holy Ghost, but this is not the Holy Ghost, the very person of the Holy Ghost. Can I say it again, something that you all know well? Justification made way for sanctification. Sanctification made way for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the baptism of the Holy Ghost made way for the Holy Ghost himself the person of God himself coming and dwelling in your being. And so now this person has a better light brought into baptizing or even baptized right in there by the Holy Spirit. But you're not hid away yet. You're not behind the veil. So if anyone comes to you and even during this convention to come and, and that's, that's as far as I said, Oh, yeah, need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I find people use that to destabilize people. I'm telling you, I'm giving you some sound instruction. Some people are, are rather forward and maybe intimidating. Say, you think you have the Holy Ghost? Someone says that to you. You look, check down your heart, look up right in their eye and their face and say, I certainly do. Amen. What do you got? Because Often people will use that tactic to destabilize a person. They say, well, uh, uh, say, I got something for you. I got a special doctrine. I got a special revelation. And all you need is this. You know what I'm talking about? You want to know where you stand and know what you have and don't be ashamed of it and say, I certainly do. I've been birthed by this word and it's been, I've been birthed by the word and by the spirit. Hallelujah. Quickly now. But he says, 
even in here. here. Here's the problem with this place. But there's days when those lights get dull. There's days when the lamps smoke and the light's not so good. There's time when those lights have to be relit again. And you have to borrow a little from a neighbor to light one candle to the other. It's still not a good light. We're thankful for it, but it's still not the right light. I'd like to say this to conclude these two courts. In these two courts, the outer court and the inner court, these are two places where the battle really rages in the mind because the mind has not come. The, the, the channels of the spirit are still very active. I hope I can get this across to you. The memory and the imagination and the conscience and the reasoning and the affection. Well, the affection can do serious damage. And all of those five channels, I want to say to this congregation without any apology, every one of us are afflicted in those channels if we allow Satan not. He will use every opportunity that he possibly can. He will use every device. He will use every circumstance to get into one of those channels and begin to cause you distress and to occupy your thoughts and to keep you captivated by it. The prophet said the Holy Spirit needs to blow those channels out. And you know when he says it that way, I, I gather from that that he's not saying it in a very uh, a delicate way. He's not saying that, you know, we just need to have a new flow and we just need to have something nice happen. He's saying the Holy Spirit needs to blow those channels out. We need a blast from God. He tries to, he tries to cabbage down. He tries to get his roots down and he needs to be removed. He doesn't go simply. He doesn't go just, you know, by invitation. He has to be driven out. Well, I hope this means something to you. Now, the prophet said that this battle, which was in heaven, and you know this so well, it's, it's from the greatest battle ever fought. This battle, which was between the angels in heaven and Satan was cast out to the earth. He said, when this great battle started on earth, there had to be a mutual place, meeting place. There had to be a place selected for the battle to begin. And this word, I don't want you to forget it, and for this battle to rage. For this battle to rage and that battlegrounds began in the human mind. Your mind is a mutual battleground that's been selected and both and Satan has a right there to that ground and the warfare will take place in that ground. And I say that that really rages in the outer court and in the inner court. Those two courts is where this battle really rages. You say, well, what is the answer? I'm going to dwell on it now for just the next time until I close. When you move on, if you're in that place and the mind has been engaged in a raging battle this way and that way and reasoning this and thinking that, Brother Ed is telling you today, you need to pack up your bags. And in this case, I say, leave your bags behind. You need to make a clear-cut decision. I am moving. I am not going to live there any longer. Listen, folks, I'm not preaching a sermon. I am giving instruction, which I believe is from the Holy Spirit. People in this congregation, you need to say, I am moving from that place. I've had a mental warfare on, 
And you might say, well, just because I'm going to the Holy of Holies, does, do, I, do I lose my mind? Do I, do I lose my thinking capacity? No. But in the Holy of Holies, you become so absorbed, so penetrated, because there's a presence there that the Holy Spirit, in that presence, the Satan cannot live in that presence. He cannot live in that presence. He doesn't have a right to that presence. I'm going to go to the one. <clears throat> and I've called this service this morning entering into his rest. And now we come to the inner rest, the holiest of all. It's a real place. And this is what Paul's whole subject's about. He said they couldn't enter in because of unbelief. If you have believed or attempted to believe in this service at any moment, this is the moment now you need to really come to grips and saying, Oh God, send your Holy Spirit and let me become so sensitized that I will grasp now every word. This is where I need to move into. The pastor saying, this is the purpose of this service. And it is. It is. Shake off. See, I can sense that even now, Satan wants to, you know, uh, kind of make, make, make our minds kind of dull and so on and so forth. You shake that off. You resist him now. Say, I came here for this purpose. I came here to do business with God. I'm not going to allow this spirit to affect me at all. I don't care where it comes from. I'm not going to allow it. I'm not going to allow it. If you sense it beside you, say, in within yourself, I resist that. In the name of Jesus Christ, I have conquering power within me over that. Hallelujah. Here's the inner rest. Here's the person. Here's the prophet's description of the inner rest. Is not tossed about. Does not run from place to place. Doesn't fuss and fume and worry about things. He says sickness may come. Disappointments may come. There isn't a person here. That's us, friends. There isn't a person here that hasn't had disappointments, hasn't had sicknesses come. And this man, this woman that's in there has had all of these things. They don't fuss. They don't fume. They don't worry about things. And he says this. Now, I'm coming to the real crux of my message this morning, the thing that's really burning on my heart. And I'm determined before God that this is going to be conveyed to you and it'll be off my hands and the Holy Spirit's going to bring it to your mind. He says, but the Christian's at rest. He keeps saying that the Christian is at rest. It's the rest that Paul is speaking about. There remaineth that some must enter into this rest. It's for us. I identify. I say, Apostle Paul, you're prophesying about me. In this day of distress, in this day of violence, in this day of inequities, in this day when we travel around the world, I tell you what, you know, I, I got distressed. I had some distress, not the kind that I'm just preaching about, but I had some distress within my heart while in Uzbekistan people earn $30 a month an average salary is $70 a month average salary a very well paid person is $150 a month and before I left before I went there I just felt in my heart I, I w would like to do something the poor have always been on my heart. And I see children, and I see them in slums, and they, I want to do something for them. 
You know, it's, it's not easy. I said to a minister, I said to a pastor, and I just related it the other day. I, I said to a pastor, we were traveling on an airplane, sitting beside me, a good pastor, this message. I call him by his name because he's a good friend. I said, I'm going to ask you a question. And I don't want you to answer me too soon. I want you to really think this out. And when you're done, I'd like your answer. Right now, here's a million dollars cash. I'm putting it in your hands. You have a million dollars cash for the gospel, for the message. You have a million dollars cash. I want you to tell me what you're going to do with that. He thought, and he thought, and he thought some more. He finally said, I don't know. I don't know what I'd do with it. I said, that's a dilemma, isn't it? You know something, friends? I have actually looked for people that would be real trustworthy, men that could make sound decisions outside of their own environment, outside of themselves, say, help these people. And I did see a man, I found a man, a man who's had a hard time, a man who's lived a hard life, a man who's, who's Satan has almost destroyed him. Now he's married and he's got one or two little children. And I, I've, I've determined in my heart, I'm going to help that man. He's living with two other families in a small apartment. But you know when you want to do good? The scripture says, evil is present with you. When I would do good, evil is present with you. It's not easy to even determine, I'm going to make a move, I'm going to be decisive, I'm going to make a move. And if some of you here got a whole lot better advice and a lot better counsel, I'd be happy to talk to you. I say that with all sincerity. And this congregation, based on a main thrust, we want to help people. This message is a blessed, blessed thing. But getting it out to people is not a simple thing. It's not a simple matter. But I will not be deterred from getting something that fed my soul to someone else that's to feed their soul. Oh, they say, well, they speak another language, and I won't let that hinder me. You, we won't let that hinder us. We'll get it to them some way, somehow. Are you with me? And I appreciate people that we're going to live this life and, and do whatever we can. So these people, and now he says, and I, I've got to get to this. Just give me about 10 more minutes and I'm going to close. He said, but the Christians at rest, knowing this, that God, God's able to keep that which he has performed, knowing that no matter what the thing is or how it looks, there's neither sickness Sorrow, let me start with that and let, let you say amen. There's neither sickness, amen. sorrow, amen. death. Amen. There's neither starvation amen. or anything amen. that can separate us from the love of God that's in Jesus Christ. There's nothing. And that's why that person who's in there, now get this, here it is, moving from the outer court. The weather's this, my job is this. My marks is this, so, and, and, and we're affected by that. Move into the other place. We got a better light. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. And, 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 but then it kind of, you know, the flame goes out, and, and it smokes up, and, and uh, we find out that that's not a perfect light. And then we find that there's another place, the difference between the outer court and the inner court. There is a knowledge. It's called a knowing. When a person gets into that, in, and you get into that presence, you know something that you couldn't know out there and out there. There's a, a special knowing. Those of you that are married, you try to tell someone who's unmarried what it's all about. 
can't really do it. So the only way to know, the only way you can really know, is you get married and you'll know. You never have children? Don't have children? Don't have children? You can never really know what it is till you have them. And when that mother's gone through childbirth and holds that baby and the father is there and then they bring up that child and you see it grow up through life, try to explain that. Try to give a scientific formula. There is no formula until you've done it. And there is no special formula that I can give you what it's like to be in that place. <clears throat> but I can tell you, you'll know something when you come in the presence of the Almighty God that you'll never know anywhere else. And there's a knowing. And that's why the Apostle John could say, we know that we are of God. How did he know that? He'd been in that place. We know we're born of God. How could he say that? He'd been in that presence. No wonder the apostle could say, for the which cause, apostle Paul, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Knowing, and the apostle John said, but we know, by this we know that we are the children of God. And he said, and if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition wherever we desired of him. He said again, 518, we know that whatsoever, whosoever is born of God sinneth not. 1 John 5, 19, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. 1 John 5, 20, and we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. The prophet said, the veil dropped behind you. The noise of the world, and when the veil drops behind you, and you experience this special place. I'm speaking to every person here. All the voices. You're alone with God. And all the voices. The voices of your friends. The voices of your family. We hear voices every day and some of them. We need that filter of the veil. Some of them we shouldn't shouldn't hit our ears and our senses. You'll have to be the judge. Quickly, how do I move into this hidden place? How do I move? I really wrestled with this because I wanted to bring it to you before I close. How do I move into this hidden place? You say, Brother Branham, we've got a picture here under consideration, but how do you get to it? What's the next thing? How do we get in there? Here's the way you come in, in the pattern. Anything that was dead lived when it came in that presence. Took Aaron's rod, and the prophet said, and notice when they put Aaron's rod in there, it budded, blossomed, and bore fruit. That's the whole cycle of life. Regardless of what state you're in or where you're at or what position you're at, you move into that place. Regardless of how dead you may feel, how untouched you may feel, how unconscious you might feel to God this morning. I have news for you. I'm inviting you. The Holy Spirit's inviting you. You move into that place. And the prophet said, you are a stick. Every man, woman, child here is a stick of some kind and you're taking off the branch of humanity which God has created. God created his son in the beginning. You may be fallen. You may be dead. You may be alienated from God. But by that in creation, you were created a son of God. You may bounce around 
and be respected and honored out there in the, in the courts. Out here, you may bounce around, he says, and be respected. But if you ever get into the glorious place and hid away with God, you'll yield to what you're supposed to do. So you take a dead sinner alienated from God without hope, without Christ, and put him in that presence, in this great glorious tabernacle in there, he will yield fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. He'll yield those. He says we come in, and here's how we come in. Number one, by refreshing yourself in a quiet time with God. This life is very busy. I don't have to tell you your life's busy, my life's busy. But the times that God is most near to me is when I get alone. Alone. Not with my wife in a car. Not out where I'm seeing all kinds of people. I get alone. All alone. And begin to talk to him and tell him just exactly. What do you say, Brother Ed? Well, sometimes I feel like a, I feel like a, a dead post. You feel like that sometimes? Yeah, I feel like that. So what do you say to him? Well, I get down. Lord, I just feel like a stick of wood. I feel, like a, I feel like a fence post. I feel like a telephone pole. I don't feel anything. I know that you're real. And I start thinking now about the various little places that he met me. And I begin to rehearse those. I remember back there, it was a real difficult time but I know it was you. I know it was you. I'd have never made it on my own. I know that you met me back there. And then there was another time later in my life, and I knew that was you. I knew it was you. Nothing could do that but you. And there was a time when it seemed that all hell came against me, ready to tear everything up. But you gave me a word. You know something, friends? You don't do that very long. You start telling him and thanking him, and his presence will just come and surround you, begin to move through you and permeate you, and you enter into a relationship. Are things any different outside? No, not necessarily, but they're different inside, and you have a newfound strength. You have a new found. That relationship invalidates what the weather is and what the job is and what the finances are and what's happening in the church and what's happening in this person or that person. We have great burdens, but that presence invalidates it. It overcomes it. It gives you strength beyond that. Amen. And with this, I close. Brother Branham told a story. He told it 38 times. The story is about, you all know it well. But I saw something I've never seen in all my years. The story is of the slave broker. That was buying slaves. And he came to this trader. And he sees a young man that is very, very different than the others. And Brother Branham says, the slave broker said, 
I'll take him. No, he said, he's not for sale. He said, but he's so different. He's so different from all the others. What makes him different? He said, do you feed him different? No. He said, eats the same, eats the same manna. The man in the outer court eats the same manna. The man in the inner court eats the same manna. The man who's in the holy place, they all eat the same manna. He says, he eats the same food. Eats in the galley. Do you, do you treat him different? Do you treat him better? No. The man in the holy place, he has troubles. And the man in the inner court, he has troubles. And the man in the outer court, they all have their troubles. Do they worship in a different place? No, they all worship in the same place. What makes him so different? He said, I often wondered that myself. Till one day I asked him. He told me he was a, he was a son of a king, of a tribe in Africa. It said, and he conducts himself in such a way, and 10 times out of the 38 times, 10 times, Brother Branham makes this comment and makes this reference that this young man said to his broker, and the broker said to him, he, he lives this way, he acts this way to keep the morale of the others up. So it isn't only that he had, he had a knowing when you come into a place and somebody tried to tell you, you haven't met God, say, I'm sorry, sir, I'm sorry, ma'am. You have no idea what you're talking about. I know I'm a son of a king. I know I'm the daughter of a king. I happen to know the royal seed that I came from. I happen to know the family I'm associated with. I happen to know the God who has given me birth. I have experienced this. And he said, with that knowing, he conducted himself in such a way, he just handled himself differently to keep the moral, the morale of the others up. Somebody beside you, Somebody in this congregation isn't having the same knowing that you have, but they need to be able to look at you and say, you know, that person is so different. That brother, that sister, that young person is so different. I crave to live that kind of life. I crave to have that kind of victory. And there is a, there's a fragrance. The prophet said it in there, you had to be anointed with the, with the oil of the rose of Sharon, the fragrance. Then he said, have you ever met anybody that's been in there? Have you ever met somebody that's been in there? He said, they're like said they've had a quiet time and they're so fragrant and their life is so fragrant so at peace he said if you come out in the morning early in the morning and the whole earth has laid quiet at night and the dew has fell softly and the fragrance is so sweet and you come out and the whole of creation is so peaceful and quiet. And he tied that directly to the person that's been in there. They come out. He said, have you ever met one? Tell you what, friends. If you haven't experienced that place. And maybe you have. But you, we, we are enticed and we come back out and we get all filled with anxiety in this world. I'm closing now. I'm just saying to you, he's waiting. He's waiting. He said, I'll meet them in there. And there's a special place. And our Lord, our Heavenly Father, the Shekinah glory that never goes out, 
is longing for that moment. And I'm, I'm inviting you to move into that moment. Take that, you have to go in quietness, and you have to go in by invitation. I'm not just a preacher here today. God didn't give me this message for any other purpose but to end up by these words. You are now being invited into that holy of holies and to dwell there to receive all the benefits that come from that glorious place. Isn't he wonderful? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Our Lord Jesus, there's something special about this moment. We've been speaking of you. We have been speaking to the very best of our ability to lay it out to the people how your prophet described inner rest, inner rest. The hidden life. And oh, we love that hidden life. We love that inner rest. We love seeing what you're doing. We love your moving of your Holy Spirit. We love, Lord, when you take and move through the aisles of the church into the homes into the places where people are now streaming move in amongst them Lord and I pray that you will take us into that secret hidden place Lord Jesus some of the people no doubt are just unsure of how how to do it would you take them by the hand I pray and those that are especially in need, oh God, that have lived a very unstable life. They don't want to. They're eating the manna. They believe on you. They are daughters and sons of God. But you want them to come into a place of sweet communion. Lord Jesus, I commit them to you now. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. Could we in, into a chamber? Would you like to stand with me, please? Into
Sunday morning to you. I hope you've received the invitation. I hope you make a decision for those that need to make the decision. Brother Ed, two things. I've made the decision and I'm moving. I received the invitation and I'm moving into that secret place, that special place. Listen, friends, Satan's going to do everything he can to keep you out of it, but you resolve today, I'm moving into that sacred place. I'm going to move into that special place. I'm moving in where he said, I'll meet you there. You feel his presence? sense his nearness. Amen. I want to sing that last verse again if you don't mind. See, I'm just waiting on him. And I want to pray with each one. Each one that comes to and those especially that have a special need. So I really need I need to move. I've lived here too long. I need to move. I'm going to pray with you and for you. Now on my pathway, the white breath. raised you may want to identify yourself in his presence raising your hand Lord we have just sung Shekinah unending is all we long for that is my personal prayer Shekinah unending and what I pray, O oh God, for myself, I pray for each one that is saying to you just now from their innermost being, yes, Lord, I'm moving on. I've been too long in this place. I've been too long affected and afflicted by my circumstances and by things around me. And I know, I know that you had me here this morning. I know, I know that you wanted me and ordained that I should hear these words. And oh God, the Holy Spirit is now witnessing to my own soul. Father, for these individuals, I know that there's men and women that are saying to you, you've had me here. You've caused me to hear these things. And your Holy Spirit is witnessing to me now that I am moving on. I'm moving on. I'm seeking to dwell under the Shekinah glory. Oh, God, you intended that for me. And, Lord, I move away from the, from the din and the noise of this world, from the confusion and the pressure of it. I move in, oh, God, where I have communion with you. And fellowship, sweet fellowship with you. Help me also to be that kind of a believer that builds up the morale of those around me. Don't let me be 
Don't let me be a, a negative influence. Let me be a positive influence upon them. Let me be one filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit. Let it run. Let my cup run over. Oh, God, let the fragrance of the rose of Sharon be emitted out, oh, Lord, with, with a strong fragrance from my life, oh, God. Let my words be seasoned with grace. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for all whose hearts are now raised up to you. I commit the words in this congregation and the evening service and those that will be baptized tonight. Father, blessings upon them. Blessings upon all who are looking and streaming now over the internet. Blessings upon them. Touch them body, spirit, and soul, I pray in the sweet, lovely name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Just before we shake hands, I want to sing with you. I'm sheltered in the hands of God. Let the winds blow. Let the storms rage high. I cannot be moved. I'm sheltered in that hand. Hallelujah. As I look across this congregation, I just think of one victory after another, friends. Every week, every day, there's marvelous victories. Let's glorify him now. the Lord. We give him glory. Hallelujah. Amen. We dismiss you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just obey the Lord. God go with you. Give you a refreshing afternoon to be here this evening. Joining in with those that are going to be baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't he wonderful? Oh, this is the best place in the world to be right now. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.